want to say to my babies <laughs> that your mama loves you so much and your daddy, these whole families love you so much. <laughs> and you guys have got to be strong. Susan and David Smith of Union, South Carolina, appear on local TV to appeal for the safe return of their two missing children. Three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alex. The police, the public, and the press join a county-wide search for the missing children who, according to Susan, have been abducted by a carjacker. Do not give up on these two little boys. I wanted anybody and everybody that that would help look for them. But after a nine-day search for her sons, Susan Smith finally comes clean. There is no carjacker after all. She has killed her children. Till the day I die, I firmly believe that Susan made a choice, a horrible, horrible choice. But she chose herself over those kids. Why did Susan Smith murder her own flesh and blood? Why did she lie to the world about her crime? Not until her trial will the whole truth emerge, when a jury will decide if she lives or dies. Union lies in the heart of America's Bible Belt, South Carolina. The lifeblood of the town is textiles. Susan Lee Vaughan is born here in 1971, the youngest of three children. She is just 19 years old when she meets David Smith. Susan and I were working in a grocery store together in Union. Um, I was a stalker and she was a cashier. And we just got to talking at work and we enjoyed each other's company. We both liked to go out and enjoy the same things like amusement parks or um, listen to the same music and then started dating. They fall in love and on March the 15th, 1991, they marry. The following October, their first son Michael is born. But the marriage is heading for trouble. They both have affairs. They break up, get back together, then have another child they call Alex. Susan wants more than David can give her, but she never lets on. Thinking back now, I couldn't, I can't think of a single thing that, that would have been a sign of things that were to come. By mid-1994, their marriage is in crisis and Susan files for divorce. Then a 911 call is received from this house just after 9 p.m. on Tuesday, October the 25th. The house is a quarter of a mile from the John D. Long Lake, north of Union. There's a lady who come up our door, and uh, she, some guy uh, jumped into a red light in her car with her two kids in it, and he took off. Susan claims her car has been stolen and her children abducted. The police track down David, and he races to the scene. Ironically, the tragedy will heal their broken marriage, albeit briefly. I walked up to the door, and Susan was standing there, and she just kind of collapsed in my arms. I had to, like, pick her up. I had to, like, pick her up and move her back on the couch. She was very distraught, very, you know, visibly upset. For nine days, Susan and David are headline news across America, pleading for the safe return of their children. I just feel in my heart that you're okay, but you got to take care of each other. But the police are suspicious. They question Susan every day. And then, on November the 3rd, 1994, in a dramatic turn of events, 
Susan Smith confesses to murdering her children and tells the police where their bodies can be found, at the bottom of the John D. Long Lake. Prosecutor Tommy Pope has just finished a case when he gets the call. I finished the prosecution of the case I had up here, and then actually we left the courthouse and were um, kind of celebrating our victory, and uh, the, the phone rang, and uh, um, we had word. They, they had located the boys in the lake. Union is in shock when Susan Smith's Red Master is hauled from the John D. Long Lake with the bodies of Michael and Alex Smith still strapped in their car seats. Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder. So I immediately got in my car, left here, and went to Union County and actually went out to the site um, at the lake where the boys recovered. Pope arrives at the crime scene and begins to build his case against Susan Smith. The night that she ran to the house and reported that the children were missing and they called David, Channel 7 out of Spartanburg came and I had the raw footage from the, the video that night that they run in the blip on the, on the thing and it was the most interesting thing. The ladies got the lights down and she's explaining, okay, when we come on air, I'm going to ask you this and this and this. And David is there, and he's got the deer in the headlights look. We call, you know, he's just like a guy who's just lost his two kids. And Susan is kind of giggling to David, we're going to be on television. The funeral for Michael and Alex Smith takes place on November the 6th. They're buried in David Smith's family plot next to their uncle. Michael and Alex were the only reason for me to get up. And it's just like, it's hard to explain, but it's, it, it's really like a, a part of you dies. Something on the inside just looks like a pilot light goes out or just a light bulb slowly dims till it burns out. There's no life. You just, you feel lost. You, I mean, it's like you don't know what to do. The reason you got up every day is now gone. So what am I supposed to do now? On January the 16th, 1995, Susan Smith is taken to Union County Courthouse for arraignment. Right. Tommy Pope announces he'll pursue the maximum sentence. They intend to seek the death penalty. Did I want an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Absolutely. Yes, I did want the death penalty. A trial date is set. There's no doubt Susan Smith is guilty. She confessed to the crime. But to get the death penalty, Tommy Pope will still have to prove she committed murder with malice aforethought. Malice aforethought doesn't necessarily mean premeditation. It can simply mean that that any time before you strike the fatal blow or pull the trigger or drop the brake that you had a, a, a wicked spirit or malice toward the individual. The murder trial of Susan Smith begins on July the 18th, 1995. As David Smith arrives at the courthouse, emotions are running high. The first day in court, when I saw her, I think it was anger all over again um just uh wanting to confront her a lot of days during the trial i, I wanted to kill her um and it, it got it got so bad in my mind that I would be, you know, studying like where the officers of the court were at and how far away I was from her and, you know, plotting. Like, okay, I can be on top of her in about three seconds and it's gonna take, I know that cop probably a good five seconds.
before he could reach me. All this stuff used to come through my head every day in court. Because I just, I wanted her to know what she had done to me. Prosecutor Pope intends to prove that Susan Smith is a monster who lied to her family, friends, and the nation about her crime. If he can convince the jury of this, she'll be the first woman since 1947 to face the electric chair in South Carolina. But I don't wake up going, woohoo, you know, today I get to try to kill somebody. I mean, I, you know, I'm, 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 I don't think you make your best prosecutor by doing that way. But, but by the same token, I truly believe in, in, in our system and in the laws. Pope's case is based on the theory that Susan Smith's affair with a wealthy local businessman, Tom Findlay, led her to become infatuated and willing to do anything to be with him. Tom Finley was a big fish in a small pond. You know, his family was well-to-do and owned the mill and, and, and financially probably as well off or more so than anybody in that town. Pope shows the jury this letter Findlay wrote to Susan. I think at some point he decided that, uh, you know, that the fun was over. And so I always said it was like a Dear Jane letter that he wrote to her and not. Uh, and he ended up in his letter basically saying she was a good girl, but they could never be together because of, uh, um, among other things, the children. One week after she received the letter, Susan Smith drove her children to the John D. Long Lake and drowned them. And I think she really believed that if, if she could be um, free of David, free of the kids, then she would have this kind of fairy tale life with Tom. David Smith attends court every day, searching his memory for anything Susan said or did during the hunt for his boys that betrayed the horrific crime. The strangest conversation that I had with Susan during those nine days was one evening she made the comment, if we get the boys back, and then she stopped, I mean, when we get the boys back, um, do you think we could be a family again? And I just thought that was a little odd because you know, first she said, you know, if we get them back. Because I, in my heart, I never gave up hope that we wouldn't find them. On Thursday, July 20th, just two days after the trial began, the prosecution rests and Susan Smith's defense begins. Her attorney, David Brooke, has hired Judy Clark, one of the nation's leading anti-death penalty attorneys, to assist him. They've no intention of having Susan testify. Instead, they'll paint a picture of her as an unstable, suicidal woman whose father killed himself when she was seven and whose stepfather sexually abused her at 16. Central to their case is the idea that Susan is a victim, not a killer. It's a story they fed to the media for months before the trial. She does not know what happened or why. She does not understand it. I will always give the defense tremendous credit for the job they did in this case because with the help of the media, they went from Susan the monster to Susan the victim during those months leading up to trial. Because Susan has confessed to murder, Brooke is left with only two ways for her to escape the electric chair. Plead not guilty by reason of insanity or plead guilty and prove Susan was temporarily mentally ill the time she drowned the boys. Under our insanity, you need to think, you know, this desk is an elephant. Not I'm, a, not I'm sitting in a desk, but I'm not just sure where I'm at. In other words, it's a very strict standard of, of insanity. And so the fact that you stop for a stop sign, you know, shows a connection. You know legal right. Brooke and Clark are left with only one strategy. They argue that Susan was not insane, but was depressed and suicidal in the weeks before the murders. She'd been drinking heavily and had had sex with four different men, including David, Tom Findlay, 
and even her stepfather. She'd also been diagnosed with dependent personality disorder, a mental condition that explains why Susan craves affection. But not everyone buys it. Please remember who the real victims were in this case. And it's not Susan, that Michael and Alex. The two little boys who lost their life. Next, Brooke claims Susan actually wanted to kill herself, but got out of her car at the last minute when she became too frightened. Their theory became kind of a, it was a botched suicide, you know, but I noted uh, she wasn't wet. She showed up at the other house and she wasn't skinned up as if I really was going to roll myself down the ramp and then bail out of the car. I mean, you would have had to, you know, get injured or dirty or something. In closing arguments, the defense tells the jury this is not a case of evil, but of sadness and despair. To Tommy Pope's shock, Brooke even convinces the judge to allow the jury to consider a lesser charge of manslaughter. Suddenly the judge decides when it goes to the jury that in addition to guilty and not guilty, he's going to also allow the jury to consider involuntary manslaughter, which was way off course for what we were aiming for. It's like a very minor charge, like a five-year charge. Despite the setback, Pope begins his impassioned closing argument, claiming Susan is a selfish, manipulative liar who killed her children so she could be with her lover. On Saturday, July the 22nd, the jury retires to consider its verdict. It takes them just two and a half hours. The jury goes with Pope. Their decision, guilty of two counts of murder. The same jury that has convicted Susan Smith of murder must now recommend whether or not she should die for her crimes. For maximum emotional impact, Tommy Pope first calls her husband, David Smith, to the witness stand. I remember I cried a great deal. Um, I was even told there wasn't a dry eye in the, in the courtroom when I got done. I had to Open, reopen some doors like memories of Michael and Alex they had already closed you know had already, like maybe I already like put on put in a shoebox and put on the shelf and then when I had to testify I had to open that box back up next the prosecution plays its ace to prove that Susan was lucid and had time to change her mind and rescue her children Pope and his team reconstructed the crime scene. We did some testing because we wanted to know, just to find out what we could find out. How long did the car float? How long would the boys have suffered? You know, was there a chance for recovery? All these different things. Pope found an exact replica of Susan Smith's car, placed sandbags in the child seats where Michael and Alex would have been sitting, and took it out to the John D. Long Lake. This reenactment is to be the centerpiece of Pope's case. We mounted a camera on the back deck. Had the car seats in there. We matched the weights and did everything scientific we needed to do. As, you, as the car would sink, you would see the water come up. And, and basically, you knew in your mind's eye that the boys were strapped in these seats. And the car is now turned up, so you're now facing down And ultimately, the, the water would go over and it ultimately covered the camera. Um, when you watch it, you, you'll literally almost start feeling claustrophobic. You know, it'll, it'll take your breath away. Pope explains the car takes six minutes to sink. Ample time for Susan to get to the children and rescue them. But before the footage can be shown to the jury, Judge William Howard must decide if it's relevant and admissible. So the judge clears the jury, the press and the public from the courtroom for a private screening. We're watching it, defense is watching it, 
it would literally, you could hear a pin drop in that courtroom and, and you just felt like you were losing the oxygen. And over at Susan's table, I heard some noise over there. And she's giggling and like playing, writing notes and playing tic-tac-toe or something. And she would kind of look up and, you know, they giggle some more, look up. But I mean, the video, she can see the video. The judge allows the video be admitted as evidence and orders the jury to return. So now everybody's sitting there. You can hear a pin drop in the courtroom, same thing. But now the jury's in. I hear a noise over there this time. Now she's crying. Hope is not permitted to present this disturbing contradiction as evidence. The jury will never know what happened while they were out of the courtroom. Susan's attorney, David Brooke, has the last word. Tells the jury that their judgment is sounder than Susan's and asks them to sentence her to life in prison. He looked at the jury in his closing arguments and said, um, who here among us can cast the first stone? Right out of the, that quote, right out of the Bible. I think it had a lot of weight with that jury being a small town and, you know, down here in the Bible Belt. At 3 p.m. on July 27th, the jury is sent back out to decide whether Susan Smith should live or die. I felt strong about the case, but there were just enough X factors in it that, uh, and I've been in front of enough juries to know, you don't know till they come back. The 12 men and women of the jury return to the courtroom after once again only two and a half hours. Their verdict is unanimous. Susan Smith will not be executed. Well, I was disappointed. Um, I surely didn't believe that Michael Nylance got justice. But uh, at the same time, part of me felt that, well, Maybe Susan, you know, didn't get the worst punishment because, you know, now she has to live every day with what she did. Judge William Howard sentences Susan to life in prison. She'll be eligible for parole in 30 years. When Judge Howard uh, told Susan and her attorney to approach the bench to receive her sentencing. It started to pour down rain over that courthouse. After he completed, the sun came right back out. And as Michael Lax's father, as uh, just a man's heart of hearts, I will go to my grave n knowing in my heart that that, to me, had to be the angels crying out from heaven. After the verdict, David speaks to the press. I'll never forget what Susan has done to me and my family, and I'll never forget Michael and Alex. But forgive, that's something I'm going to have to deal with, I guess, further on down the road. It took many years, but David finally found mercy in his heart. It took a lot of years, though. Um, I knew, I, part of me, I guess why I struggled with it, because I was so mad at her so you know I had to forgive her because that's what God tells us to do and I had to forgive her to be able to move on with my life at first Susan Smith had an entire nation glued to their TVs praying for a happy ending the Lord and, and myself both know the truth I did not have anything to do with the nine days later the mother of those two missing children became the most hated woman in America.
David Smith will never forget the crime or the trial, but he has managed to move on with his life. Now I have two more beautiful children. My daughter Savannah is 10 and my son Nicholas is eight. And you know, they're my inspiration now. Um, they relighted that pilot light that went out when Michael and Alex died. And so everything's going real well. I have a good life now.